I cannot get this one. Uh, praise the Lord. I am thankful for this opportunity. It's going to be time for testimony. But uh, we are using this time to uh, have two groups. I will go first. And then after I have done this short presentation uh, of uh, mission experience of Gospel Sounders, we love our brother who works in Baringo coming to share his mission testimony. Let's pray as we begin this. Our Father and our God in heaven, I am so thankful that you've given me another opportunity to stand before your people to share how you've led us in the past making of our history. I pray that you may bless whatever I'll say, that it may inspire someone to go outside there and to work for you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Well, uh, I'm Zadok Ponde, and uh, I'm one of the speakers and workers with Gospel Sounders. And uh, we are a team of workers, about 15 full-time workers, for working with Gospel Sounders, and I'm standing on the behalf to be able to share their report and their experience. And those workers include Sammy Wilberforce, who is working in the publishing department, or also acting as the secretary of the ministry, Brother Weekly for Mondi, acting as the treasurer and medical missionary worker. Then we have Brother Kimaru, who is acting in the capacity of a missionary worker in the areas of Mount Kenya. Then we have Brother Masharia, who is working down in Taita Taveda. And then we have Brother Dickens, who is working uh, in Malindi. We have Brother Adson, who is working, uh, Elder Adson Simi, working <clears throat> from Bungoma. Uh, we have uh, Brother Kefa, who is working in Kisi, uh, Nyakorere. Then we have Samuel Onchera, who is working from the other side of Nyamarambe. Then we have Wycliffe O'Wall, who is working in Dewa Mission Center. We also have workers who are working in our uh, restaurant. We have Sister Diana and we have Mrs. Wycliffe. And we have a final worker, Steve Omondi. I am presenting this mission uh, report on their behalf. I'll not be able to go through the experiences that that ministry has gone through, but I hope that this will inspire someone. And what I've decided to do is to tell you little about ourselves and more about how the work started in Kenya for your sake who are from the West and for the sake of those of us who are here and do not know how the work began here in Kenya. And that's why I have mentioned, as you can see, mission trip to British East Africa or modern Kenya. But basically what I want us to think about is who shall go to tell them about Jesus. The reason why I, 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 I mean, I mean I'm, I'm saying that is uh, some years back, I went as a missionary to Pokot. And while as a missionary, I met a couple number of people in Pokot who didn't know that Jesus died for them. I actually sat with them in their own houses it from a skin of an animal, a hide of an animal in form of a plate. We climbed the hills and I asked them if they knew of a man called Jesus. And some or most of them told me they didn't know of a man called Jesus. It's a long story. And they didn't know that Jesus died for them. And the question is, who shall go and tell them about Jesus? And that inspired me. Uh, and many of us in this ministry to working the marginalized places in this world, this country. So one of the stories that inspired me and inspired us as a ministry is these words of Alan, or rather David Livingstone. He says, death alone will put a stop to my efforts, was the exclamation of the man who died upon his knees in the art of Africa, praying for the open soul of the Lord. Such determination in a life of such self abnegation as that of David Livingstone can only be understood in the light 
thrown upon life's duties by the words of the master, I do always those things which please him. Certain it is that our Father in heaven has a well-defined plan to reach for each of his children, and just to the extent that, uh, just to the extent that that plan is found and followed, does any life attain completeness or true greatness? Another man that you'll recall when you're talking about missionary experiences. You can want to say it. Sorry for that. Um, the life of another man that inspired this ministry is the life of one man, Joseph Wolf, written in Great Controversy. Dr. Wolf traveled in the most barbarous countries without the protection of any European authority. Enduring many hardships and surrounded with counter spirals, he was bastinadoed and starved, sold as a slave, and three times condemned to death. He was beset by robbers and sometimes nearly perished from thirst. Once he was stripped of all that he possessed and left to travel a hundred of miles on the foot, on foot, on foot through the mountains, the snow beating in his face and his naked feet, benumbed by contact with frozen ground. When warned against going and armed among savage and hostile tribes, he declared himself provided with arms, prayer, zeal for Christ, and confidence in his health. I am also, he said, provided with the love of God and my neighbor in my heart the and the Bible in my hand. The Bible in Hebrew and English he carried with him wherever he went, of one of his later journeys, he says, I kept the Bible open in my hand. I felt the power. There's a problem with the projector. I felt the power, or rather, I, let, I felt my power was in the book, the Bible. I'm sorry. I kept the Bible open in my hand. I felt my power was in the book and that its might would sustain me. And Ellen White says, true education is missionary training. Every son and daughter of God is called to be a missionary. We are all called to service of God and our fellow man and to fit us for this service should be the object of our education. It is this uh, inspired word that have inspired these 15 group of workers to continue laboring for Christ 
to open or to fulfill the prayer and dream of one David Livingstone that God might light Africa with the light of the gospel. You might not be able to see my screen, but what I have here is when Kaskalen approached Kenya, which was then called British East Africa, he wrote back to America, and these are the words of Kaskalen, the real need here in Kenya is the need of the gospel. You go to places and you realize very little that the greatest need that humanity has ever had that can solve all their problems is the need of the gospel. And once he stepped into this land, Kenya, he was inspired by Luke chapter 9, verse 62. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And so Kaskalen, this preacher of Canadian origin coming from the United States of America, never looked back. In a dark world, naked spiritually and naked physically, he planted the gospel, the gospel of the true God the gospel of the true Sabbath, the gospel of the three angels' messages. Kaskal and Arthur Asher, Granville, 1879 to 1964. The first Seventh-day Adventist missionary who came to Kenya planting his foot on the shores of Lake Victoria and planting the first missionary field with a grass thatched house on the, on the top of one hill Gendia, which uh, necessarily was not Gendia, but was get in deer, but understood by the Africans as Gendia. Arthur Asa Granville Kaskalen, born in 1879, I would consider him one of the pioneers of the faith, pioneering the work in East Africa. Uh, to George Edward, 1844, and Odelia Phillips, Arthur grew up in the United States of America. He was baptized in North Dakota with his parents, his brother Amos and sister Mary in 1899. As a young man, he worked with his father who taught him many skills, but now realize, because these are some of the things that have inspired us. As a young man, he worked with his father who taught him many skills, including, but not limited to, carpentry, farming, and metalwork. He was a fit man to come to Africa, not just because he had a Bible in his right hand, but while he carried the Bible in his right hand, his left hand also worked as a carpenter, as a farmer, and as a metal work. The person who began the mission work in Kenya was not just a preacher, but a man who could work in, with his hands to earn a living. It is said formal school for Arthur ended when he was 10 years, or rather 10, and became an apprentice farmer, a carpenter, and a blacksmith. Although he was keen to learn his father's trade, he was an avid reader and, and, uh, and had an ambition to become a teacher. Thus, he attended Union School in 1901 to 1902. He was such a brilliant student that he completed a two-year course in one year. In 1904, he entered Duncom All Training College where he completed in September 1906, received ordination uh, uh, and was recruited by the General Conference President A.G. Daniels to help strengthen the young Adventists in Britain. And the, he works as a call for to a worker, did ex extraordinary things, and I don't want to read all those two things, and he took his route to Kenya and the two missionaries coming over to Kenya, meeting with the Malawian that led him to Kenya, sailed from Hamburg, Germany on October 1st, 1906, and route to Mombasa. They met one A.C. Ennis, the island port of Tanga in Tanganyika, present Tanzania, waiting for them. And the three left Tanga and arrived in Mombasa November 27, 1906, when the local church missionary society agent came across their names on the passenger list he went on board and greeted them as fellow Christians. This Anglican friend performed an act of practical Christianity by offering to process their heavy baggage through customs and forward it through his organizations, well-established channels to their final destination. And that shows actually where the work began in the areas of Rachuonyo, Suba, Omabe, Nigori, Kuria, Gucha, Kisi, and Yamira. The work began in Kenya and it continued. What I want to notice is that that was their first building as they planted 
our first house in the part of dark continent was opposed grass papyrus weeds, but we did not occupy this very long as we commenced the work on a good stone house almost at once and have been, been privileged. You wrote to the general conference, you can find that in general conference bulletin 158 paragraph three on your uh, Ellen White estate. And you are, could have been privileged, but I have been privileged to visit that area. Um, there's something I wanted to mention because uh, uh, that is, this is important. Later, he was joined by his wife, Ellen, was a capable seamstress and a challenge was not the lack of written language in Kavirondo, they co currently called Luos, a tribe that I belong to, but the lack of any clothing at all. Realize what they did. The Nilotic Luos were not into clothes and Ellen sought to change that situation. So apart from soliciting for garments from the homeland, she became rather a useful cotton grower, which cotton was used to make clothes. This industry contributed to the effectiveness, listen carefully, this industry contributed to the effectiveness of the message. And this again inspired us to raise institution that can fulfill Isaiah chapter 58. They did not only start um, a farm that grew cotton and did seamstress work and tailoring, farming and doing all these things, before they baptized in Gendia in 1911, after about five years of labor, it is interesting to know that Kaskalen decided to translate the local, or rather the Bible and certain articles into a local language then called the Luo or the Kavirondo language. And indeed it is true that one of the things that our ministry has been involved in is the publishing work, including the translation of some books into local dialect. God has been able to enable gospel sounders to try as much as possible within their strength to establish publishing houses, which is run one in Butere, another one in, uh, in coordination with Brother Bernard in Oyubis, and then we have small printing within different regions, including Bungoma, Malindi, Laikipia, Kilgoris, and many other places that we've been able to send printing machines, binding machines and paper cutting machines, and out of the country, we have been able to facilitate the same in Sudan, in two places in Uganda. And the intention is to print small booklets and small leaflets for the preaching of the message of the one true God and the three angels message in its holistic nature. In 1911, they baptized people and we all know that one of the first people who was baptized was one, the grandfather to Obama, who is probably known by you guys as having been one of the presidents in the United States of America. I don't have time to read all this. They actually were able to translate a hymn book. Gospel sounders have been able to, as much as possible, try to get into this work of hymns, but not limited to that. They've also been able to do publishing through um, quarterly printing of lessons, rearrangement of pioneer lessons and printing and distribution as much as they can through the ministry of Brother Sami, who is the leader, Brother Ken Maosa, Brother Brian Onango and Brother Stephen Kosgay. The altar and the plow are the experiences for all who seek eternal life. We are nearing the close of this earth swiftly. There are men who will be taken from the plow, from the vineyard, from various branches of work, and sent forth by the Lord to give message to the world. Men will be called to work for the master in all parts of the world. But realize this, apart from the call of Abraham, that Whichever, wherever the word of God has been faithfully preached, results are followed that are tested to its divine origin. And what I want to zero in in the work of Gospel Sounders is the work that has been going on in Lycipia. Uh, we conceived the concept of going to Lycipia in the year 2019. And when we conceived the concept of going to Lycipia in the year 2019, 
it was not an easy decision. For one, there were no Christians there who believed like us. It was a place that was covered with banditry, and it was a place that was covered with nomadic pastoralists. It was a place where people were poor. It's a place where people stay far from one another. It's a place that is hit with drought. And for the past three years, it has been drought stricken. It was not an easy decision. The last time that there were banditry attacked, our worker was there. And while he was there, he had gunshots while he was in the mission center. We prayed and we were able to have him move to the next town for his safety and left the property in the guidance of holy angels. We had to think about whether to relocate from Laikipia or not. But having prayed and thought about it, the question is, who shall tell them about Jesus? Having been convicted that God had sent us to Laikipia for a purpose, we decided to continue working in Laikipia. But apart from banditry, the sanitarium was actually hit by a serious drought for a period of three years that reduced all the plantation and vegetation within the property uh, to nothing. There was a decision that was to be made. What shall we then do? Shall we leave, drill a bowl, or do what? We could not drill a borehole because of certain issues, even though we had decided that you do everything to drill a bowl in that place. There was no food to be grown anymore. There were no fruit trees that had been grown and everything had been, uh, everything that was green had been reduced, had been, I mean, had dried up. We had to make a decision again. What is it that we shall do? We were inspired by that quote that inspired us to start Gospel Sounders. 1 MR 228, paragraph 2. God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. This is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitariums, hygienic restaurants, treatment rooms, and food factories. This is our purpose in carrying forward every line of work in the course. And since we could not do some of these things because of what nature had supplied, we decided to venture into doing ministry to the people around that area. And since our missionary was a man, he could not be able to reach easily to the female Samburu um, people. And so God blessing him with a wife, they began ministry, supplied with a tailoring machine. They began to make clothes and supply clothes for the people in Samburu. This actually is how we began the work. We began the work in a place that was pretty scarce with very few trees and dry, scarcely populated and dry. And the work continued and soon enough, we were able to raise the first building for the sanitarium which is basically a four bedroomed house with a living room and a kitchen, which is inside the main house. God was able to help us in a few more years, probably this year to be able to raise an exterior kitchen and also to build the first toilet, probably in a long span of uh, miles or kilometers within that vicinity to teach the principles of hygiene to the community. Ellen White says sanitariums that shall be established are to be God's memorials, agencies in the conversion of many souls. Our sanitariums have been established for the purpose of preparing a people for the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Inspired, yet not able to get every resource to help us run a sanitarium as we needed food production from the farm the medical missionary in the place decided to start a work of preparing herbal uh, formulas and being able to help patients to receive the herbal formulas with little ease and at lower cost. And that is what we have done for the past few years since 2019 within the sanitarium. The sanitarium work handling lifestyle disease and treatment protocols, education of health principles and spiritual health and growth. And this coming year, we are looking forward to holding a training of a few workers in the sanitarium. We were involved in house to house ministry and community outreach, which then opened a mission to the nearby prison 
in Laikipia, where now our Bible worker is able to continually go to supply Bibles to the prisoners and reach out to them. Organic farming and coaching on hygienic uh, gardening, um, gardening principles. How was this possible in a dry place? One day while we were working with Brother Sammy Wilberforce in a farm at my home, something came to my mind and I say, we must do it right away in Laikipia. And we did it. We decided to buy a shed net and having bought a shed net, we decided to uh, block an area. And with that area, we were able to raise story gardens and we've been able to use story gardens in 75%. Um, what do you call those things? Shed nets to be able to grow food. And as we speak right now, the sanitarium has food sufficient to sustain, sustain the workers, vegetables to sustain the workers there um, of different kinds using story gardens. I don't have an image for that, but perhaps you could see Brother Sammy because we have some photos for that. But we were able to build a, a garden that requires little water to be able to water the vegetables. And by that, He's been able to supply the needs of the society that is going hungry, that is going without clothes. God has inspired us to work to reach the community through benevolence. And so he's been able to supply food, to supply clothing. And not only that, but in many places, God has inspired the ministry to fulfill the mission of Jesus Christ by coming closer to the people, by meeting their needs, putting shelter, dressing them, and then bringing the word of God to them, bidding them to follow Jesus Christ. And so far, that church, or rather that sanitarium, has also become a place for worship every Sabbath with our brother, Wycliffe Omondi. I have just shown you one of the treatment rooms there in Laikipia, and one of the brethren that ever visited there. And those are some of the Samburu Ads boys and sometimes the donations that are done within our sanitarium to keep them going. Not only that, Gospel Sounders have been involved in massive distribution of books through the ministry of Brother Ellie, Brother uh, Edson, or rather Hudson Simeon, Brother Zadok Pone, myself, and a brother there that you might not know, but is a very ardent Bible worker and is not here. Brother Amos, uh, Brother Amos, say hi to the congregation. In picture is Brother Amos who has helped to distribute. These books have gone in many areas. And having been a custodian of these books, I can count to the number of over 400,000 books that have passed through me in the past years that have been distributed through the ministry of these three brethren, or rather four brethren. We have been going from market to market, planting a speaker on top of my car and on top of Amos motorbike and distributing, distributing books to different people after sharing a short message with the assistance of the brethren that are mentioned. Holding medical missionary trainings and cooking classes in various places. God has allowed us to experience um, what it means to fulfill the mission of one man, Kaskalen who actually started the work in Africa. When Kaskalen came to Africa, he wrote back to the General Conference and said, Kenya has one need, and that need is the gospel. And that gospel is what we want to supply. And how do we want to supply it? Through raising of more publishing houses, through raising of farms, organic farms, through raising of self-supporting missionaries who can go to hard areas and work using their hands to supply their needs and also to give a right example to the society. In fact, I remember to mention the list as I end that while we were raising a farm in Laikipia, the county officer came to us and told us, you know what, the county is willing to give you one acre to teach people that you can grow food in Laikipia. Um, You can do anything despite the fact that you don't have everything. And that is what our missionary decided to do. Using pots, he decided to raise herbs and to raise vegetables. The only shed he had at that time was the shed of the heaves of the house of the sanitarium. 
but he never tired and was not discouraged. He never left to go back to his home with a wife and a child. He decided to have on the uh, surroundings of the wall, pots of vegetables where he planted vegetables, herbs and certain fruits as he prayerfully waited for a rain that never came for three years. In various places I am ending, properties are to be purchased to be used for sanitarium purposes. When opportunity offers our people should purchase property away from the city in which there are build, buildings already erected and fruit orchards already in bearing, land is a valuable possession. That is what actually like Apia was reduced. And yet we are still there to continue with the work till God bids us go. Our farms, were turned into dry, dusty fields. But yet we continued working there. The water tanks that were built went dry. And we decided to do what any man can do to build bricks for the beginning of the next construction. By faith, trusting God, plan to build more rooms and a hall for workers and for students. You are able to burn 20,000 bricks for that work. I don't have much to say. That is the work that has been going on with this ministry, planning meetings, running Zoom meetings, and trusting God that through this work, many souls will come to Jesus Christ. May God bless you and God keep you as you continue fulfilling that desire of David Livingstone, that God may light Africa with the light of the gospel. That message, that desire of Kaskalen, the desire that Africa may receive the gospel, the desire that institutions might be raised. Kaskalen started the work by raising institutions. He was able to baptize people after many years, but he had already started a publishing house. He had already started a farm. He was already supplying clothes to the needy. And this was the work that broke the hearts of the ardent young, or rather, Kavirondo society of community. The ardent Africa. Africa was opened by the gospel of a Bible in the right hand and skills in the left hand. If the work began in Africa that way, why would we want to finish it in another way? May God bless us. May God keep us in Jesus Christ's name. I will invite my brother who's been working in Baringo to come forward and share his experience in Baringo. God bless you.